Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service this morning. And uh, of course, a special welcome to those who are joining us online for this service, either through video or on podcast. Uh, today is the fourth Sunday after Easter, and the theme of our service this morning is um, the Good Shepherd, as you'll realise from the reading when it comes later in the service. But first we begin with our acclamation, and please remember, you do not shout on this occasion, as you would normally do at Easter time, you just say it quietly. So, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to begin by sitting and listening to the hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, a lovely hymn of praise, sung here for us this morning by the Evangelical Movement of South Wales, uh, recorded at one of their summer uh, festivals or gatherings. <laughs> together. And so trusting in God's promises through Jesus Christ, we make our confession to Almighty God, saying together, Most merciful God, 
Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> and now stand to say the glory. Glory to God and our hands, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we bless you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of God, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the living one, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God our Father. Amen. And the collect for the fourth Sunday of Easter. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Raise us who trust in him from death to sin to a life of righteousness, that we may seek those things which are above, where he reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Now we sit for our reading. The reading is taken from the book of John, the 10th chapter, starting at the 11th verse. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I will lay down my life to the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Hugh, for that reading.
service. It says address, presentation, or activity. Well, I don't think we're in the mood of an activity this morning, um, but we will try our hardest with an address. And I've been thinking back to the shepherd, that passage which uh, Hugh read to us so beautifully this morning, and what it might mean for us today. It's a, it's a very popular image in, in the Old Testament uh, to describe the relationship between God and his people. Uh, we all know the 23rd Psalm, which we've just listened to in a particular version, uh, but the same imagery or similar imagery occurs in other Psalms, 77, 79, 80, 95, and even 100. There it comes out again. And <coughs> where the Messiah is described as a shepherd, but not only the psalmist, but also Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel also speak of God as the shepherd and Israel as his flock. You might have read the, I'm sure you have read the parable of the lost sheep in Matthew 18 and 15. And Jesus also speaks of, of the people as sheep without a shepherd. And in Matthew 9, Mark 6, or the, the sheep being scattered when the shepherd is killed. Um, Mark 14, Matthew 26. And there is the well-known blessing which we have at the end of uh, the book of Hebrews. Our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep. The question is, does for me, does this imagery, which was once so potent, still hold good for us. I think there are two problems today for people. The first one is that in Jesus' day, shepherd was a very familiar figure seen everywhere. And in a pastoral society, sheep were very important to the economy. They served in all sorts of different ways, also in the religious rites. Today, most people in the Western world live in towns or cities as we know, perhaps 85% or more. And the question is, do they ever see a sheep? Um, well, actually, if you haven't seen one, I'm sure you all have. There are a few over the church yard wall this morning. I thought of bringing them in as an official aid. <laughs> I thought it was a good idea. So we, we leave them there to enjoy themselves. But have you ever seen a shepherd? You have to be up early in the morning comes every day, like all good shepherds, to feed, to water, and actually to count the flock. Very small at the moment, but the flocks can run into hundreds, as you know. So counting is important, given their ability to stray. And that might be a surprise to some people, I think, to realise that those checks have to be made every day, and it's important um, for a conscientious shepherd to do that. And it's demanding both in time in vigilance. So there's a problem. City dwellers perhaps are quite unaware of that aspect of, of rural life. But I think there's another problem which we in the church often overlook. She are very simple creatures. Look in their eyes sometimes, over the fence there. Uh, they've got very little brain in between those two eyes. Uh, uh, they are often thought of as being stupid or even perverse creatures who will always do the thing you don't want them to do. Uh, at least the shepherd will tell you that. The gulf in intelligence between these creatures and the shepherd is absolutely enormous. And as an illustration of the gap between God and mankind, that illustration may serve us well. However, is it true today, or was it ever true, of the difference between ourselves and our leaders? Over the centuries, Christian leaders have, I think, appropriated the title of shepherd to themselves, or at least to their leaders and ministers. It often happens in the case of uh, sects that they, cults, that they do this very much so. And the bishops carry their crosiers to indicate they are shepherds. Um, of course we need leaders, uh, and I've heard clergy sometimes talk about my flock, 
as well as their personal possession, my clockwork do this or do that for the other thing. Um, some years ago, <laughs> at a church function, not here, I hasten to add, I overheard, which I was attending, I overheard a recently appointed vicar say petulantly that he wasn't getting his own way over some issue. And he remarked, they need to learn to hear the shepherd's voice. <laughs> a rather senior member of his flock uh, who overheard the comment remarked, I think they hear the shepherd's voice very clearly, Vicar. It's your voice they have trouble with. <laughs> <laughs> People can feel sometimes rather patronised, and we have to be aware of that. And it's often the case that the rank and file Christians are just as intelligent, if that's what you're looking at, and sometimes more spiritual and more spiritually aware than their leaders. And as a clerical person, I'm very conscious of that. And I've met many people in my life who have no particular role in their church, and yet their spirituality is far enough way above mine. The image of the shepherd and his flock just simply doesn't work for many people today for one reason or another. And so I suppose the question this morning is, what are we to do? For my part, I would like to return to Jesus' teaching and focus on the one and only true shepherd, Jesus Christ. For that is what Jesus taught his disciples. We are all sheep. And there is only one shepherd and the only one way into the fold. We can emulate the qualities of the shepherd. Of course, we should do so. Vigilance, courage, patience, and unstinting love for other people are all important in our lives. There have been many examples, I know, recently during this pandemic, of pastoral care being in exercised by people for those around in the community not just their neighbours but sometimes people they don't even know caring it's there but I believe we always have to remember that we are not the shepherd the shepherd but we are his assistants in his task you know even at the end of St John's Gospel um, we didn't read this morning that part, right at the end of the Gospel, where Peter is being reconciled to Jesus on the beach. And Jesus' final words to Peter are, feed my sheep. Note what Jesus says, my sheep, not your sheep. We are, I believe, sent out. That is what the word apostle means. We are sent out to proclaim the good news and to draw others to Christ, who alone is the good shepherd. Amen. And now let's stand and declare our faith. And we say together, though he was divine, he did not think of equality with God, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a slave, which was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Now, Sarah is going to lead us in our intercession. Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty God, our <coughs> Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son Jesus Christ to hear us when we pray in faith. We continue to meet with joy to worship you, our Father, this Easter time. And our joy is this that He who was crucified, dead, and buried is now alive forevermore our risen and reigning Lord. 
He is the shepherd, and we can trust in him to know us and care for us. We pray for the church throughout the world, for this diocese and for our own churches, St. James's, All Saints, and St. John. And for all those who continue to lead us in our quest for knowledge and understanding of God and his purpose for us. Strengthen Ruth, our Bishop, and all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all the nations of the world, and for peace in those countries where there is persecution, warfare, and sectarianism. We ask for God's mercy on those countries that are struggling with seemingly uncontrollable outbreaks of COVID-19, thinking particularly of India and Brazil, where the suffering and consequent fear is so great. May countries like ours, where the virus is now less prevalent, be generous in sending ventilators, oxygen and vaccines to those who are in need. Help us all to look beyond our own boundaries and to show by our actions that God's love is universal. Bless and guide Elizabeth our Queen. Give wisdom to all in authority and direct this nation and every nation in the ways of justice and of peace, that we may honour one another and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we continue to rejoice in the glory of Easter, we give thanks for the beauty of our surroundings this magical spring. The joy of the risen Christ is reflected in the splendour of the unfolding natural world around us. And we pray that the commitments made this week by many countries to seriously reduce their carbon emissions may be upheld in the years to come. May we all take responsibility for the preservation of our God-given world. And as COVID-19 restrictions ease, we celebrate the joy of being able to spend time with friends and family once more. Give grace to us, our family and friends, and to all our neighbours in Christ, that we may serve him in one another and love as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are sick or suffering. May they know your presence and be aware that the love of the risen triumphant Christ, the same Christ who all suffered, also suffered such pain while on the cross, that love enfolds them and protects them. And here in our parish, we pray particularly for Bishop Peter, Liz Elvins, Tim Walton, Jeff Norton, Sarah B, James, Celia Hahn, Pauline Kay, David, Jackie Bravery, Jim McGeer, Myra Burrows, Pat Gray, Pippa Cobden Ramsey, Katie Brookman, Russ A, Rachel, Ken Martin, Nigel J, Neil A, and Karen Taylor. And we take a moment to pray for those known only to ourselves and to God. And we ask God to give strength and courage to all the people who love those who are ill. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. 
Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them to the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have died this week and for their families. We continue to pray for the royal family as they mourn Prince Philip. We give thanks for the strong faith in God that the Queen displays. May her example help all those who mourn. And may the nation's appreciation of the lifetime of service given by Prince Philip help to succour and support her. Hear us as we remember those who have died in the faith of Christ. According to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all your saints, we commend ourselves and the whole creation to your unfailing love. Christ, our life, you are alive in the beauty of the earth, in the rhythm of the seasons, in the mystery of time and space. Alleluia. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we say together the prayer which our Lord Jesus Christ taught us all to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Glory. Amen. 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 And now we're going to hear our final hymn. It's one you all know very well. Very appropriate because we're still in the season of Easter, so that's fine. I discovered, just say a word about it, that uh, it was written by a Swiss clergyman in the middle of the 19th century. The words were added to it. Um, the famous music by Handel uh, from Judas Maccabeus, his triumphal entry into uh, the temple, which overshadowed in some ways, or foreshadowing, I should say, Jesus' own uh, arrival in Jerusalem. But there it is, and uh, I think clergyman saw that uh, it was a wonderful tune, it was a pity that it was wasted because people hardly ever went to listen to the uh, whole of the uh, oratorium by hand, so he took it and he wrote some wonderful words to it, and uh, eventually they were translated into English, not till the late 30s, believe it or not, more than about 60 years after he'd written those words, and uh, but it's uh, gradually found its way, as things do, into the English hymnals and the books of hymns in this country, and so we have it now, it's become one of the most popular hymns that we have in our total repertoire of hymns. Thine be the glory, risen and prince son.
jump up and sing that fully and loudly. Well, we relied on the singers of St. Martin's in the field to, to help us through that one. We look forward to the day when we can all stand and sing again, but there we are. Uh, just before the blessing, you might like to know that the music at the end of the service is from Louis Vann's uh, first organ symphony uh, that's played in Toulouse Cathedral. It's just the finale. Um, I'm not expecting everyone to stay for the whole of it because it's quite long. Um, but it's something to send us out, I hope, with a bit of joy in our hearts, a bit of action, and a bit of enthusiasm. So here we are. So let's stand now for our final blessing. And it's taken from the final chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews, famous verses. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make us complete in everything good, so that we may do his will, working among us that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you now and always. Amen. Amen.